you can kind of lead me, segue me into the, the book part. Yes. Prior to getting started. Okay. 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 All right. So I do shout out first. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm, we are such a silly goose here. We are such a silly <laughs> goose. We're such a silly bunch here. And that bunch is filled with two people and one dog. And our names are Jaren. And Heather. And <laughs> we are your hosts of Typically Divergent Podcast. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Wait, he goes by he, him, and I mm. go by she, her, just so y'all know. Yes. We, and, we, we can't forget that part. And Dozer, <laughs> Dozer is a, um, he's all genders. I love it. He's all genders. And the when whole I, spectrum. The whole spectrum. Mm. And when I think about him in my head, he is wearing a purple dress with a red flower on it. Oh and like, he's wearing a hat. Like and, down a runway. Yes. Have you seen those TikToks where they like walked out, like where they have their pets? I've seen cat ones where yes. they have them walk down like a runway. Yes. And he's walking on his hind legs with a yellow purse and he's singing and walking on sunshine. Dozer Donatella. <laughs> Dozer, Donat- Dozer Marie Mendoza, Donatella Gianni Versace, Reisinger Williams. That is yes. my princess. Yes. So welcome back to the show. If you are no- <laughs> If you are not new, if you are new... Well, bless this lovely mess. <laughs> what is happening here? It's all good. It's, all, it's good. all good. We're 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 having a good time today. Yes. Um. So I think we're just gonna dive right in here. Oh um, yes, we have a lot to go over today, folks. We yes. did quite some research for today's episode because we wanted to be very respectful for it. So we are going to dive in a little bit today. We're not going to have as much fun because we had fun for the last two and a half weeks. And so we wanted to do a a serious episode today. So Mm -hmm. um, first, we're going to get right into um, our tarot cards first, as Mm -hmm. usual. So Heather, what tarot cards do you have? What tarot card do you have for us today? Yeah. So I pulled the King of Wands upright. Okay. um, And the King of Wands, and (laughs) it's funny, I was telling you earlier this, but uh, for our audience, um, I feel like I've been drawing wand cards a lot lately Mm -hmm. i'm I'm pretty sure if i if i if i remember correctly thinking back on some drawings for myself both on and off the podcast um and i think a lot of the wand cards do have to do with like planning and taking action on plans idea making and honestly kind of like the process of manifesting from like that manifestation Mm -hmm. episode um and maybe you're in that type of your era right now maybe just a lot of a lot of internal focus focused internal work yeah, and I think also like wasn't when we did the um the astrology thing for the year. Mm-hmm. I feel like the one that you told me was very much similar to that as well. Mm-hmm. So it's like if I'm thinking back and then this one too. Um but of course so this is uh the king of wands which has to do with leadership, uh vision, entrepreneurship and honor. Um basically it's a very it talks about having pure fire energy and a very masculine type of card in the type of energy that it has less so into creation and creativity and like the dreaming of the ideas Mm -hmm. and more so on taking the ideas that you already have and enlisting others around you to participate in enacting those plans Mm -hmm. so delegation leadership obviously comes with that um and you know working as a team with others to actually make those plans happen so it sounds like you're already like prepped and ready without even knowing it that you are ready to start that next step of spreading that work onto other people i hope so yeah i like i i it's it's kind of i i the imposter syndrome in me has a hard time has a very hard time accepting this (laughs) i know you know um but it also it does talk about having opportunities presenting themselves to you and or new challenges that you might not have been aware of prior and so when faced with them it's a reminder to um you know face them head on and also enlist those around you as applicable um to work through those with you and of course I always relate this to my career <laughs> and my job, um, but I do think it applies to life and just other things too going on. So, well, good. Um, yeah, I think it works. Um, and we are trying something a little bit new. Um, we're going to switch back and forth. So I'm doing a tarot card today for this episode, and then we're going to switch that up with our mental health as well, especially since we do also have so much to talk about. So... That's our tarot card section for today. Uh, Jaren, how's your mental health doing today? Well, it's really interesting that today would be the day that we'd be recording and my mental health is at its 
peak for this week because nice. it was so fucking terrible this entire week because Ooh. the weather's been so crappy. Yeah. And it was really sunny outside on Wednesday, which is my day off. It was beautiful. So beautiful. And I am so happy with how I spent my day. However, I spent... I chose to dedicate the first three and a half hours of my morning to finishing a puzzle. That's really nice, though. I it, like that. It was. And then I spent a lot of time in the kitchen cooking. And then I had therapy. And Ooh. then I went to the grocery store to get more ingredients. And then went back home. And I was in the kitchen. So, like, I didn't <clears throat> give myself enough sunlight. I see. Yeah. But I, I got stuff done that was important enough for me to do on a day off. Mm -hmm. Um and things with therapy were really great. Um, we talked a lot about TikTok <laughs> <laughs> and how I'm feeling about that and a lot of reassurance. And um, like I've told you guys, like, I don't know if I've told it, said this on the podcast, but I know like I've told Heather, I found myself becoming unhealthily obsessed over numbers and likes and basing my self value in social media interactions and i know that that is like a new thing for like the newer generation of teenagers uh, like that's a, a problem for them and i did not want to dive into that mm -hmm. and so she was like well you are trying to like grow something so the amount of time that you're putting into it is healthy as long as it's not debilitating you if it makes you feel better to go check something then check it but it if it's going to drive you nuts all day, if you're going to get a, if you're not going to see something that you like, then don't. So she's like, you have two options every time. So just choose whatever's best. Yeah. So it's been nice and I'm still having fun with it. And, um, but yeah, like I feel like I'm on upswing right now and Good. yeah. Yeah. So thanks I, for asking. I get what you mean about the weather too. Like I, I definitely get the seasonal affective yeah. funsies. <laughs> the saddies. Um, yeah. Seasonal affective saddies. Yes. Um, and it's it's so hard, especially when you do get a warm, sunny day in the middle of what really is still winter. <laughs> and even early spring when it's still cold, not to like put that pressure on yourself to like force yourself to go outside and do things. But it sounds to me like you actually still had a really nice and productive day. Yeah. It's just that almost like seeing that made you feel like oh but how come i didn't spend my day this way yeah and like remind yourself that it's okay not to put that pressure on yourself yeah yeah because i can still get some sometime sun time you know they say like what 20 minutes a day yeah i would i need like 20 years yeah <laughs> like just put me in a just put me in a happy lamp yeah so. yeah oh my gosh i need my own little happy lamp but one that doesn't also give me skin cancer like you know like tanning beds do they and all stuff. Well, can you just get a happy lamp, like a, just can, a lamp that has like that vitamin D without giving you the UVs? Yeah, I think there's ones that like <laughs> people in the office, like in offices have them. And like, I, I think like people at work, you know, like it, it became like a thing in like 2020. And it was like, find mm -hmm. some ways to make yourself happy. Yeah. Um, but I feel like they're kind of questionable as to how well they work. I will admit from the small amount of tanning in tanning beds like i did not do a lot i did a small amount and i did it in very short stints because i burn very easily and when i would travel it would help me not to burn as much i do not condone tanning beds also if you want to use them i'm like i'm not judging i just you know like yeah, from a safety standpoint we don't judge but we also we, know we don't what's want cancer and what's not healthy yeah. but i have to admit in full transparency laying in one of those beds like on even the low setting for like five minutes i felt like warm and sunny and it really did help yeah. but i also don't want the uv radiation right. so um you know i haven't i haven't used a tanning bed in like in years but mm. um it helps i don't have as bad of a burn when i do go on like a vacation particularly like if i'm going down like more south somewhere Com like in completely spring. away from our hemisphere yeah hemisphere what's the yeah. word uh, Not ozone uh like region just like yeah. just region la yeah. lateral your your latitude where yeah your latitude is with your launch your... <laughs> latitude. Your latitude. i think i think you're going is you're going closer to the equator someone, someone with a lot of uh background in this educate us but i'm pretty sure we're just white the, i'm pretty sure the sideways are latitude yeah yes they are because i remember a teacher saying remember latitude and fatitude 
And so like, wow, okay, thank you so much. Wait, latitude and what? Latitude and fatitude. So like fat wide. Oh my god. Latitude is that... latitude. Okay, horizontal. can we just be real though? Say teaching that way ha- would not age well, right? Because like today, I like with, that's so that's so toxic too. Don't don't do that, guys. Yeah, don't How, do that. Don't do that, but that's what I have done to myself for the last twenty seven years. That's what you learn and that's your way of remembering it. It's like once you learn something like that though, you can't get it out of your head. And right. like that's how someone taught it to you. Like that's not anything on you. I'm just saying, like, we're not condoning that either. <laughs> but it's, it is it is kind of funny. Yeah. I'm uh, wondering if there's anything else that's, like, stuck in my head like that. Anyway. Yeah, I'm sure there are things. And we'll, <laughs> and we'll find out as we age. Because things, as they become more and more acceptable or we, we change how we term things for the better, we realize... Well, right, like terminology and stuff that we use is super wrong. I well, think the, the the R word is one oh, really good yes. example. Well, you were talking about aging, and then I remembered that um, I have gotten my cannabis use under control a bit more. I have been able to remember a lot more of my childhood, and I get like these little pockets of weird information and memories that I'm mm. like, oh, wow, like either – and it's been like good and bad stuff, mm-hmm. but it's also like, oh, so that's where some of that little trauma comes from. Yeah. Or like, oh, that's why I've enjoyed this specific like meal yeah. or um, place in yeah. Fort Wayne. Well, that's good. It's like, it's good. You, it's hard if it comes rushing back or in a way that you don't want to experience it. That's oh, right. obviously where therapy comes in. But right. if it's in like a more positive way or it's like slow in a way that you, you now have the, uh, the tools to process it right. in a healthier way I, I feel like that can be helpful right well and that's another thing to increase my mental health recently is the fact that i'm remembering so much more mm-hmm. that i i truly wanted to probably forget um anyway I, my choo-choo train just stopped that's that okay. was it i started to think hey you know we were gonna shorten the chit chat section and then just like the two peas in a pod two peas and two <laughs> we're doing fine two on time pe- two peas in the adhd pod <laughs> two peas in the adhd pod we, which we... are also i yep sorry that, that would have been a great segue into the disclaimer for this week's episode so let me go ahead and just say this really yeah quick. go ahead and actually what okay tell us please also what this episode is about because i i think that's important oh well actually we need to we owe a shout out to our hundredth follower on tiktok oh yeah and then i and then um we can be the yes. silly peas in the pod um real quick before we get into today's episode we do want to make um a shout out for our 100th follower on tiktok because i did say that i was going to do that and i wanted to make sure that if that person is now listening um and i told i think i told them that i was going to i don't fucking know anyway but i did say i was going to do it so uh congratulations <laughs> to at the rusty coke can <laughs> <laughs> okay can i be real the rusty coke can okay y'all have an awesome username okay well the reason why they're following us is because i did a, a gay tiktok uh-huh i did the the bare face i love it and i tagged i used the gay hashtags and so i am assuming that this individual is of the alphabet mafia and that's the reason why we got the follow but well I, either way i love their name the right. rusty coke can the rusty coke can so hopefully you are it's, listening to this week's episode it's it's very it's very american and also just like here i am i wonder if their name is in reference to something that has something to do with a, a member of their body like mm. how we talk about mm-hmm. with our microphones mm-hmm. so anyway mm-hmm. welcome <laughs> welcome to at the rusty coat can welcome to our um community of <laughs> highly anxious individuals <laughs> so anyway guys my apologies we are all over the place today today's episode is going to be um a, an episode in respects for black history month we had asked the audience you guys a couple weeks ago if there were any um overshadowed stories or individuals or parts of history that we should look into instead of um reciting the same stories that we have all been told about hopefully um like martin luther king or rosa parks Mm -hmm. um so in 
to be respectful of that community, we do have a disclaimer for today's episode. And um, Heather and I would like to make a point to let all listeners know that we acknowledge and have checked our own white privileges. Because we are supporters and allies of all minorities, we understand that we did not nor will ever live the, quote, black experience that a significant amount of individuals have or will have to endure in their lifetime. We fully understand that we are just two slices of Wonder Bread on I this podcast that. platform. I we mean, are it melanin is true. challenged. We are we are melaninly challenged. So we understand that we with this plat- podcast platform speaking on behalf of the community that we are not a part of, but that doesn't mean we can't give respect to where it's due and to continue to educate people on real historical happenings, especially the ones that get swept under the rug or whitewashed. Which I mean, uh, come on, if you live in America and if you are not blind. We all know that it, most of those stories are all in favor of the white man. Mm-hmm. In respect for Black History Month, today's topics will be over hushed history for the black community, and we will continue to defend minorities until people of all shapes, sizes, and colors are viewed as actual people. So um, we have a few different things to talk about today, um, but one of the things that we wanted to talk about in the beginning and sort of relates to... Um, the topic of Black History Month, um, people of color, um, and also other marginalized communities, though, is there is something really important that has been in the media a lot lately, um, has come up in the news. I know when we have chit chat sessions, sometimes I, you know, bring up some of my own passions about things that are happening around in our country and the world. And I, I thought it was important to put into this episode. Um, And Jaren and I kind of talked about that. In relation to this episode subject matter, many of you have heard about the rise in book banning around many more conservative states of the U.S., with Florida and its governor at the public forefront. For more local listeners, particularly of Indiana, yes, there are actually some banned in Indiana, particularly Carmel, Indiana, over by Indianapolis. (gasps) shocker what a, what a fucking shocker do you know what sundown towns are yeah i lived right there for a part of my training they're in like my career. a1 veneers white in care oh oh 100 percent. and when i when it's I, like creepy when i had just learned about what sundown towns were and i did some research and stuff Car- carmel indiana of course like mm-hmm. surprisingly fort wayne it ha- was not one mm-hmm. but carmel indiana mm-hmm. was yeah it's 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 kind of it's kind of creepy yeah. Um, it's, it's it's a it's very such... nice, beautiful place, but like, like I mean, I uh, but yeah, but I'm there. but I'm a white person, right? So right. It, I I lived around there for a little bit less than a year, but during part of my training for my school stuff. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So I did want to mention that. Um. They do have some banned books. Um. I am bringing this up because some of these books are even simpler children's books that highlight the culture and representation of the black community, as well as other people of color and marginalized groups, as I mentioned. This is a dangerous trend that was also prevalent in 1930s Germany to promote a nationalistic and certainly a white supremacist mindset. Obviously, this is anti-progress for human rights, so, as we can imagine, this is why I thought that talking about this would be good for this episode. Um, so, in relation to that, um, I wanted to bring to the table some resources. Pen America is an important organization working to compile reports and index these banned books. They are a 501c3 organization founded in 1922 and eventually became an international organization in the wake of World War I to promote freedom of expression, particularly in writing and journalism. Hell yeah. You can visit pen.org, so P-E-N dot org, to easily report books that are banned or under review for being banned in your area. And I'm like, literally, it's anonymous. You can just put in the information of like your like your school area or whatever the the school district that you're living in the potential book and they'll like look into it and potentially add this to an index i think that's fucking awesome right that somebody's out there doing this work yeah and this is actually where a lot of the information is coming from like if you've seen uh like news articles where they have partial lists from like certain counties in florida Um, uh, Duval County, Florida is actually one specifically that's probably been in the news or where a lot of the lists are coming from because they're one of the, the very, very involved in, um, restricting 
all of this in the, in the actual book bands. You can also review their compiled index, and may I recommend utilizing this as a targeted reading list, not only for yourself, but potentially children, especially of the adolescent age category. The link to easily access this index will be in our links at the bottom of this episode's show notes. I also wanted to note that, you know, like just check it out in general, consider supporting this organization. They do take donations. You can also become a member of the organization, um, but in order to protect free expression and human rights. Um, In addition, and in case we have listeners from areas already experiencing intensive book banning, um, we are including a link at the bottom of our show notes to Brooklyn Public Library's Unbanned program. This is actually a teen-led program. Way to My go, God. Gen Zers. Is great job, Gen Z. I honestly want to, I knew that there was this program, but I didn't know that it was teen led and teen initiated. And I was like, that is so awesome. It's literally like these kids in New York City who have better access and more freedoms than their counterparts are helping their own people. I, I don't want to wish my life away, but I look forward to that generation being in political power. Oh, me too. Me too. I mean, I feel like millennials are losing their, even some Gen X, but some Gen X as well as millennials are really losing their opportunities to lead in this country because the older boomer and even silent generation, because, oh my gosh, some of those politicians are decrepit. They're like in their 80s, man. I mean, Biden is in his 80s even. Yeah. Um, no offense, but like I'm just saying, and I'm not saying he's bad or, or anything, but like in general, there is a point where you truly need to pass things on to people who actually have investment in the future of the country. You're also going to be dying in like three years. So yeah. why does it fucking matter what kind of p- rules I and laws like you want I almost feel like there's pass? implicit bias. And like when I'm that age, like I also shouldn't be leading things. No. I should be just like enjoying my last years <laughs> and let the other people like do it, you know? You like, know, Courage the Cowardly Dog. I just imagine yes. you as a Miriam. Oh my God, I'm such a Miriam. <laughs> oh my God, yes. Oh my gosh, and Spencer would totally be like, what's his name? Like, just like the crash. Like, he's like, I hate people. He's this. <laughs> yes, he's, he's this. Just like, I hate people. So it's a teen led program. Again, this is called uh, Brooklyn Public Library's Unbanned Program. It provides anyone ages 13 to 21 a free library card to BPL's digital catalog from anywhere in the U.S. Your local public library may also be working to fight against book bans, so please support them if so um but basically you can get a free electronic card if you're within that age group and you're in a band like a heavily band book band area but really anywhere too maybe you live in an area that doesn't have a lot of access to um or, or like a good library um and the brooklyn public library is pretty dang good um so you know check it out and i think it's really important. So hell yeah. Thank you so much for bringing that on to today's episode, Heather. I really yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. All right, everybody. So, um, again, remember our disclaimer from the beginning and also please, um, remember that I am not the greatest <laughs> with research and I do my damnedest. I watched... did a good job. You guys. Well, it's just how I'm going to present the research is going to be how my brain works. And it's also kind of like how they presented this movie that I watched and what we're going to be talking about today. Mm-hmm. And I chose to watch the Lowndes County and the road to black power, which was on Peacock TV. Um, I understand that not everybody has every streaming service platform. It's more likely that somebody's going to have Hulu or Netflix. So the chances of everybody else having seen something on those services would have been much higher. But I chose to watch this on Peacock because um, voter pres- voter suppression continues to happen is specifically for um, the black community. And it mm-hmm. has happened recently within the last couple of years. And there was that one politician, I think it was down in Georgia. Uh, Stacey Abrams. Yes. Okay. So yeah. Stacey Abrams had to go and do her own canvassing and help getting people registered to vote. And the turnout great was so fucking amazing. She's actually like a former representative at this point, And she's kind of gotten just more into the activism realm. She was a prior representative. Okay. Um, I have a hard time remembering remembering details on the top of on, okay. on the top of my head but she has tried to go for different positions within the state since then and actually yeah. for federal positions as a representative for Georgia right. um, but she has worked tirelessly to increase um, voter turnout and work yes. to help people get registered which is really important so yes and she and she started doing it because of um, the one time that she ran and then saw the voter turnout and how 
little amount of um, the black community had been voting. Mm -hmm. So she went and turned it fucking out. Mm -hmm. Oh, and she's also a lawyer. So she's a highly educated woman. And I think that's awesome. Hell yeah. Black women (laughs) in power. Mm. Awesome. I love to see it. We're just going to go ahead and and paint you a picture here. So this is Lowndes County, Alabama. And this is one of the poorest counties in the country. And it's unfortunately located right outside of Montgomery, which is the capital of the state. Population at this time was um, 80% black. And the county was so poor that some homes didn't even have running water. Okay, so we're we're talking like some serious poverty here. Interesting, because that's continued to be a, pr- a water access even in certain states oh have yeah I been an issue recently wasn't i can't remember I if think... mississippi last year they had like a giant break in their like water and like it was just like they didn't give two shits about their people it was terrible probably and i mean we... just like they don't give the shits about the people out in ohio with that burning of the train yeah and flint michigan probably still doesn't have water i mean don't quote me on that yeah. but I, uh, r- clean running water oh absolutely there are no libraries in their schools and most kids didn't even go to school for most of the year some even started working as cotton pickers as early as three to five years old and so remember remember folks this is the night early 1960s and so this is yes so this is around the time of um segregation okay but 1960s when you think about that, like the it's industrial revolution ago. happened in the early 1900s, where they then, like in like the 1920s and stuff, they enacted rules and laws to protect from child labor. And yet, like here we are, but like black children in the ni- 1960s in right. the South are like at the age of three to five still working as cotton pickers. Right. And the reason why they were cotton picking was because of the system called um, crop share, which was their modern day slavery. It's terrible. Um, and this was for the um, African American community that wanted to live on land that technically at one point had or still was being owned um, by white folk. And it was their way of paying off their rent essentially, and they were expected to maintain all of this land. And um, residents of the crop share program were then put into debt and they would use like a credit system for items and goods within the public systems, like at the grocery store. And then uh, which essentially was giving them a continued unfair advantage to getting them ahead and on their own so that they could buy land of their own and go live their own life instead of having to still live on their previously um, their, their their once previous owner. You know, what's crazy about that is that I, I remember learning in school that this type of system existed from sort of like the end of slavery and like until like somewhere in like the early to mid like 1900s. But I don't think they really expressed very well, even in my more, I guess you could say liberal education in New York, Mm -hmm. did they express that that was so ingrained even into the 1960s in a lot of areas of the South. Right. Like, I like the way that you learn about it, it kind of suddenly just like jarringly changes into, well, like, you know, they would go to school and get their own education and do their own thing, but they were just all segregated, like right. as a community. But you didn't know that they were actually many of them still working as almost slaves. Right. And they weren't even getting the proper education that the other white kids were getting. And even if they were segregated or um, intertwined with other white kids, I mean, violence Mm -hmm. you know i mean so what was it ruby bridges was the first um one to go start going into a white school i feel like that is correct Mm -hmm. and you know the those people that were throwing rocks and yelling at a little child those Mm -hmm. people are still alive today yeah those people are grandparents with kids yeah my just, my parents were born around that time. I know. And, so so were mine. And they are alive. In the 60s. Yeah. Um, it just really gives you some perspective on things. And like I in throughout this, one thing that I learned even in like reading some of our show notes ahead of time, but I wonder if our audience will feel the same in listening, is that like even if you had learned certain things in school, there are so many aspects of this that are still missing. Mm -hmm. And like, it makes me feel like, wow, even what I got and what I thought was decent was still like overall piecemeal of other important things that we should learn about. Right. Yeah. Um, So there were through discussions of injustice, um, the town was named Bloody Lowndes. 
because of how many African Americans that would come up missing. Oh my God. And it was very obvious what was happening. When it came to political <sighs> rights, 5,122 black residents were eligible to be registered voters, but zero of them had actually been registered. People's lives and jobs were in danger for helping black folk getting registered to vote. Um, there would be like um, fear tactics. Yep. Um, even ex-military African Americans were not qualified to vote. So how Stand fucking up. fair is that? You're sp- you're asked to go fight for a country that doesn't even give you American rights. Yeah. You're talking people who like at this point like fought in World War II, and then maybe like the 1950s would have been like the Korean War. So right. if we're talking 60s, it's like. I'm thinking like World War Two and Korean War. Like that that's some um, that's some crazy shit. Right. I'm so glad that you're more understand you you have a better historical knowledge than I do. No, that's okay. I'm, I'm like Korean War, sure, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> I was I, the Cold War in there too. Even, even though I'm a millennial, I have watched a lot of MASH, which actually I think millennials would like because there's a lot of like uh anti war stuff. It has a lot to do with healthcare too. So You and my dad would get along. <laughs> Even Dr. And this place was so bad that even Dr. Martin Luther King wouldn't attempt to lead the community because it was so dangerous. Mm-hmm. All right. So yeah, that 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 is uh, that's pretty telling. <laughs> yes. So um, now we have um, some pretty important people and some pretty big named associations. Okay. So we have John Hewlett. Um, he was a Lowndes County resident, graduates and moves away to Birmingham. He joins the NAACP chapter, which is a national association for the advancement of colored people. Returns to Lowndes County in the 1950s as a registered voter. Wow. Good for him. In the 50s. Right. Um, In March of 1965, he and his wife and a group of 30 plus other members, members, they weren't members yet, but 30 plus other adults marched down to the county registrar's office and they were asked to leave their, oh, because they wanted to um, register to vote. Okay. So then the county clerk um, was asking them to leave their um, names on sheets of paper so that the officials could quote literally this is from the movie check to see who's pushing against unquote, wow. the white power <laughs> the lists the lists uh that creeps me out with just some of the current political atmosphere because there's a lot of talk of people like getting lists in places like texas and tennessee and florida yeah. and georgia and like uh yeah um, so they went back two weeks later with an even larger group to request the same rights. And then they were faced with the same, like, all right, leave your names and you know, we'll get around to yeah. it. Yeah. But also they're marking you down as targets Correct. for potential violence. Again, like Correct. thinking about how it was called Bloody Lounge. So. Right. In late March of that year, um, this group then founds the Lowndes County Christian Movement for the Human Rights. And it started with 27 individuals. Um, and the reason why they were able to get away with what they would be doing with this group was because they were under the names, they were under keywords that would indicate a church. So they mm. were allowed to get away with like congregating. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yep. Because they were like, oh, we're just, just Christian people just doing some, doing the loads of work. Uh, okay. Sorry, Christian this, folk. No, no, this, this actually, okay, as a, as a, as a white person who, could always still learn more. It does make me wonder because when I have learned about things during the civil rights movement, particularly, there's a lot of references of like Christian this or like church that like with some of the civil rights organizations. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if like, you know, they're not the only ones. There were multiple organizations that did that. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think even like one of MLK's organizations Mm-hmm. was like a christian based thing yeah and it could be that too but it also offers extra protection so that's a really good point yes um so then we have the sncc which was also called snick um this is the student Nonviolent coordinating committee mm. this had been started by ella baker and um the most dominant groups that actually came from snick are and they're still around today our Nashville student movement, this included John Lewis, Diane Nash, Bernard Lafayette, and Howard Universith. Oh, <laughs> never mind. That included John Lewis, Diane Nash, Bernard Lafayette, and then there was another group that came from that called the Howard University People. Mm. Um, and from that group, we have Stokely Carmichael, Cor- Cortland Cox, and Cleve Sellers. Now, Miss Baker, she was... Qu- oh, the epitome of a black Southern woman. I just wanted to curl up into a fetal position and sit in her presence mm. while I was watching this movie. Cause I was like, I just, 
She was very she's inspiring, very strong, yeah. like knew what she needed to do kind of person. Right. So that that's like what like for like modern day of someone who's had some more attention about things, like that's what Stacey Abrams reminds me of for today. Yes. And um there was a, a point where that when they were interviewing Miss Baker and they all anybody that talked about her all said the same thing that she knew that egos were being involved with other movements and um she didn't say names dozer dozer set and she didn't say any names but she gave that look like i mean let's be honest who are the biggest names that are that everybody knows about right now mm-hmm. so and we're not shitting on martin luther king or malcolm x but she knew that whatever needed to be done needed to be done in a different way than how other people were approaching their movements what she was seeing was that these other bigger names would involve the entire community and then they would just kind of leave and expect and, and expect that the community would be able to defend themselves and continue forward with the work that they had started mm. and um once your leader is gone yep everybody's going to get turned on to yeah they're you, going to get turned on by the police if you think about it in a sense of like Im- put it under the perspective of it being a war zone yeah so like not to get super political but like when we think about like when america leaves a foreign nation after being involved oh you talk about happens? like iraq and yeah. afghanistan yeah what happens because and we destroyed their system and expect them to fix it but or, like hey we don't know what to do you guys fucked us up or like europe carving up africa and parts yep. of china at the at like at different times and getting into the opium wars like all of that fun stuff Yay, you know when opium yeah when uh when people like do things and ruffle up feathers of whatever is going on there and cause chaos and then or like they think they've made an impact and maybe it's good at first but then again like leave and leave the people that they're trying to defend but don't give the tools to the people that are staying there to defend themselves Correct. that we have a problem on our hands Correct. potentially and especially i think she she was probably right because this county sounds like it was extremely violent and extremely oppressive to the black community yes. that lived there so yes. yeah no I, th- I think she probably had the right idea yep so then we have stokely carmichael and he was a 23 or 24 year old um veteran organizer and he would lead groups to people he would lead groups of people to go out into the public and essentially interact with the white people in power to get seen to be heard mm. he was the first one who was not afraid to speak with the police and has been quoted to say Quote, arrest me or let me do what I have to do. Ooh, I like that. Yes. And there was another gentleman that they were interviewing, and they said that um, Stokely Carmichael would speak to them in a language that they understood. Mm. So he had more education. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Which is unfortunate that that's what it takes. And that, to me, that's a little bit sad. But Correct. I'm. It's it's good that he was able to do that. Yes. Um, so then SNCC was then invited to Lowndes County and they set up a home base in Lowndes County in order to protect their local community. And SNCC's goal was to move quietly and mm. to stick around within the community. And like an underground force. Yes, yes, almost Love like an it. underground force. Um, thus de- and so they decided to stay and then they developed the Freedom House, which was their headquarters. And then there's Tent City, which were the dwellings where SNCC members lived. Ah. This was funded by money donated f- to the Southern chapters from the Northern chapters. So like, and like how Heather was talking about, like how we were taught with the history, we were just kind of like, Hey guys, like there was the war and then black people were welcomed into the community. And that's not, that is not how it happened. Segregation happened for like what, 40 to 60, 70 years. Yeah. So, or like to the degree that the segregation happened. It's like, we moved on to knowing about, like you go from like the end of slavery, knowing that there was like some, some share cropping. And then you move forward, like post-World War II, now we're going to come back to this and oh, there were Jim Crow laws and there was some segregation, but like yep. the in between and then also how severe it was. Right. Like, Things were not black and yeah. white for them. Yeah. Um, so it's not unheard of that there would be northern chapters um, within the U.S. SNCC would go to other towns to encourage and empower their local residents. And they would set up their mass meetings in different towns and would set up even educational classes like math, literacy, and teaching people how to do their taxes. That's awesome. Yes. Wow. If we, should, we, we need that more. <laughs> yes. So then we have the first major event 
that started to really anger the community and to give them the anger that they needed to feel empowered to move forward. So Tom Coleman, a deputy sheriff, was employed by the state of Alabama to maintain a low-level prison, pulled a trigger in attempts at shooting Ruby Sales. Again, remember the head organizer of SNCC in mm. a local grocery store. Oh, my God. Um, Reverend John Daniels, a white man, tried to protect her and was killed because he oh. was he was an ally of this community. He was helping them. And remember, white people would be threatened if they got caught assisting people of color. Yeah. That actually happened to my grandfather. Yeah. He was in the Navy. Really? And like he would, he would be stationed down in the South and most of his friend, most of his like Navy friends yeah. were black people. And yeah. they, it was like at a time when segregation was like fulminant and yeah, yeah it was crazy. He's told me some stories. And then father Richard, um, Mary Rose was shot in the back. Um, he was a black man. Um, he was out in the streets calling for help, and, of course, nobody helped him. Um, mm. The story, of course, was changed from murder to self-defense by the news and the townspeople. Of course it was. Of course. The town gave money in support of this man's defense because, quote, he stands for what needs to be done. Holy fuck. If that does not scream white power and people of color need to fear white people and even white people need to fear the white power this reminds me of freaking what is what's his name who got like off without any issue who shot people during the black lives matter um kyle rittenhouse yeah fuck him yeah, yeah. And totally reminds me of that because like conservative people funded him and like we're yes. giving him like basically high fives right fuck him right and of course Tom Coleman was found not guilty by, of course, an all-white jury. Mm, of course. Um, there was a quote within the um, interviews from a woman who was white. The implication of Ameri African-American voters meant the possibility of different people being in power. So let's take away all of this not-so-great qualities of these people and just understand that they are humans who are afraid of change. Mm -hmm. That's understandable. But when you start to act out from your fears and you start putting people's lives in danger and killing them and not giving them basic human rights, then, okay. Remember guys a couple weeks ago when I said, I can't meet you halfway in the middle. Can't meet you halfway in the middle on that one. Yeah. No, nope. yeah. it's understandable to be afraid, but can't do that. Then in 1965, um, the voters rights had been passed, but that really hadn't changed anything. The purpose was to represent the mass of the communities and to change the, in changing the people in governmental power. So the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party took to the council that they wanted more accurate representation in government offices. Of course. Like, why would anybody want that, right? Mm -hmm. The Democratic Party at this time ran by Lyndon Johnson is mostly racist Democrats. They did say in the documentary that open racism wasn't in the Republican Party until much later down the road yeah so that that actually did get talked about in my history class i took took ap us like the college like us history so one thing that sometimes people do forget is that around i want to say it was around the civil rights movement there was a progressive change um between the democratic party and the republican party in mm. terms of the racism and the the, the racist per se <laughs> yeah. being represented in the party so in actuality pre-civil rights and pre this change if you want to think about like who were the racists who were the ones that were part of the south in the civil war and wanted to separate and wanted to keep their slaves that was actually democrats yep. so that's democrats and Republicans were like Abe Lincoln were like those that was like the, Let my you know, people go. yeah. And then when it, I can't remember the exact details, but it has to do with um, like the urbanization okay. like movements and when um, the black communities were moving into areas where like white people were living and like different things were happening with that okay and like one of the parties i don't know if it was like the republicans like were like oh come to us or something and like 
I can't remember, like the Democrats actually started helping some of the black communities and then moving and stuff like that. And then there was like this switch Okay. and there was a trickle down effect in the South where like up until maybe even like the eighties and nineties, there were a few, what, what they call old Southern Democrats. Those are the people that like, I think have finally died out when it comes to politics, but I think did exist even in our politics when we were kids. Yeah. Um, very, like, became rarer and rarer. Most of them transitioned <laughs> to Republicans, but some of them held on to that, like, I'm not leaving the Democrat Party. This is part of, like, I'm from South Carolina and I wanted to, like, be a part of taking away from the union and all that stuff, fly the flag, whatever. So... Like this, the old Southern Democrat is like that term that you'll hear for people like that. Okay. Now that was like a very roundabout explanation because I can't remember the details, but that's some of it. Okay. <laughs> you, well, can, you can cut part of it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so again, the Democratic Party had denied their request and they were given the option of having, quote, um, two seats at large. And they were not actually nominated or even voted into office positions. And that's when we find out that politics really isn't about a morality. It's about the power. Mm -hmm. So we have another gentleman. Jack Venice was the primary researcher for SNCC and had realized that the Independent Party was an option for Alabama. This was the groundwork for the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. Literacy was so bad in Alabama that instead of using words to help voters choose their candidates, they would use symbols. And the symbol for the Democratic Party was a white rooster with the motto around the icon, white supremacy for the right. Oh, my God. Imagine the illiteracy being so bad in this area that even as a white person, you're voting for white supremacy without even realizing it. And you're just voting for white because that's just what you're told to do. And there's Mm -hmm. there is no other person to vote for that is not not white. So Mm -hmm. and then we have Ruth Howard. A SNCC veteran presents a white dove, which was honorable, but um, this was about power. This was not about being nice. She took a trip back to SNCC headquarters in Atlanta, and she visited Clark College, and their mascot was a Black Panther, and the Lowndes County loved it. And they had said, you know, cats are cute and sweet, but if you back them into the corner, they're going to they're gonna bite back. Yeah. And that's exactly how they were feeling in that moment. Mm-hmm. Now, these residents not only have a chance to cast a vote, but they also have a chance to run for office positions because of being able to vote, um, being able to run for um, private parties. Okay. In order to teach the candidates on what those jobs are and the responsibilities of those jobs, the SNCC headquarters held meetings in Lowndes County and Atlanta and they made comic books because remember they were educating people Mm -hmm. and they made comic books that would thoroughly discuss the responsibilities of each position and it was the video if you guys have a chance to check it out the comic book is so cute it is like it's like an action book and it's like it gives them basically a step-by-step example on what they would have to do in their job and what that would entail these positions would be of the following there were three candidates open for the school board one for the coroner, one for the tax assessor, the tax collector, and then the sheriff. First nomination convention was held in 1966, but the people not only just left for work to go vote, you guys, they showed up in their Sunday's best. They came oh, fucking respectful. That is amazing. They came in clutch, snatched, on period, whatever you want to fucking kids, whatever you kids want to fucking say these days, <laughs> they Fire. came. They, they, they boots the house down honey in their sunday's best to go cast their votes of course large newspaper companies such as the journal gazette or new york times would write this calling it quote reverse racism but really the people of Lowndes county just wanted their equal opportunity to have a voice a necessity for african americans that was viewed as a threat by white people reverse racism right Wow. Right. Not the term that we hear all the time nowadays. Right. Every time a white person becomes fucking uncomfortable in this country. Right. The merging <sighs> of this private party and the Democratic Party had never happened, leaving the back Black Panther nominees to go door to door to encourage and educate African Americans on voting and getting them registered to vote. <sighs> okay. Beautiful. Sorry, guys. I farted. Beautiful. All right, and so then we have the James James Meredith March in 1966 in Mississippi. 
Um, James Meredith was, a, was of course, um, an African-American student that integrated into University of Mississippi and walked 250 miles from Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi. Yes. Jackson, yeah. Mississippi, with a sign that said, quote, register to vote. <clears throat> Have no fear. When he's amazing. Absolutely. I mean, to be brave, to be walking through a su- through the, southern states like and that. And to walk through yeah. that and have not have gotten literally murdered. Well, <laughs> you hold on. When he stepped out in Mississippi, a white man came out from a bush and shot him in the back. Fuck. Almost. We were close. I knew it. When Stokely, remember the gentleman from mm. earlier. Man, I didn't even read the next sentence. And I just was like, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. How did nothing terrible happen to them? And I'm like. Oh, something terrible happened. No, no, it did. Okay. When uh, Stokely was released from jail after his 27th time, he became frustrated and he and the Lowndes County Freedom Organization came to the conclusion that they needed a better way to organize their people. Real quick. So I take it James Meredith died, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. I just, okay. So the term, quote, black power was created during the Mississippi March. And this was from having African-Americans. And this is, of course, for having African-Americans in political power. Current day whitewashing news is going to say black power means that they want to take over the entire country. I'm not even going to spew the bullshit that I have heard from other people that are Caucasian. No, not even Caucasian. They don't deserve that. They are white. And it is just really sad to... The, to hear the things that come out of these people's mouth when they think is going to happen to this country if a, a person who's not uh, the sh- the same color of the piece of paper that they write their laws on mm-hmm. is in power. Yep. Well, and I mean, it's kind of interesting. Like, it, it actually does show that these people fear their own guilt for what the things that they have done because they're afraid that they're going to be treated the same way that they treated them which is literally admission that you are a piece of shit because you have treated other human beings less than worse worse than animals right you're quite like you're you're high key admitting i love i I learned that phrase recently you're high key admitting that you are treating black people like shit and you're afraid that you're gonna get the same stuff back like and ironically you don't but they act like they will or that they do and that becomes a motivating factor even today even today even today oh snap (laughs) <laughs> sorry guys we are no, it's, it's, we are getting heated up it's in this, very in, in this it, studio. it's just very interesting yes um uh so again uh like what heather was talking about this is also fear monitoring party members in favor of voting for black panther party were encouraged to go vote and then immediately go straight home stay away from the violence mm-hmm. get out of sight from the public's eye because you're safer at home just go cast your vote and get the hell out of there the opposing white side didn't believe that any of the African-Americans would make it even on the ballot. And when they noticed their progress and the political canvassing, I love that phrase, political mm-hmm. canvassing, they became scared and had to start encouraging their own white people to start voting, which was something that had never even been necessary until now. Oh, boy. Um, there are some video interview recordings that are shown. Um, the first is one of a black man who's surrounded by four or five white men. And the guys are almost using a form of tokenism, like the body language that I was getting from it. Um, because they're like, yeah, like we're just, we're just, you know, bunch of five, a bunch of five guys. We're just, uh, we're just, we're friends here. You know, look, we, we have a black friend. We can talk, oh, God. We, look at us, talk to him. So, and so they're talking to him and they're like, quote now you've been friends for now we've been friends for years haven't we and we've always been great to each other haven't we you know like who would you go to if you were in trouble the white people or the black people oh my god they're like gaslighting this poor black man like on 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 tv or whatever like this video interview oh my god because like ideally in a, a perfect world you would go to the people who are on the police force, but of yeah. course they're white and yeah. th- they're not <laughs> today. They're not, <laughs> you can't do that either. And these people are not going to go th- to them. So oh. um, the man is obviously very uncomfortable, smiling and trying to laugh off the question like, huh, okay. And then his face changes and says quietly, the white, like as if somebody like was intimidating him. <laughs> that was, was off holding camera. a knife behind his back. Yeah. In another interview at, uh, Two white men are in the establishment and one guy goes, quote, none of them are even qualified to hold these positions. They don't even trust each other to vote for one another to represent them in government. 
they would rather have a white man do it. Yeah. End quote. Nice. Thank you I so mean, much for speaking on behalf of 80% of your population uh, that you are not a part of. Yeah. I mean, that's the same gaslighting and manipulation that white people use to um, defend slavery. They were like, we need to do this because at that point, I was going to say that black people, but the straight up actual just Africans that they brought over. Oh, we, we need to teach them our ways. We need to, you know, put like make them like a human and we need to show them the way of Christianity and civilize these people. Like, right. and, and I apologize if this is triggering to anyone. I just, that that's, it's crazy because you see that same mindset mm -hmm. in just in a different format in the sixties. And I'd like, I'm immediately going to like the ways in which that kind of mindset is still used today. Oh yeah. So um, residents of Lowndes County continue to organize using their organize organization as inspiration and the black Panthers party of self-defense. They organized in Oakland, California in 1966. They did not organize around the gun, but they did use the guns in order to you in order for self-defense. But in Oakland, California, they're using the guns to back the to get the police to back down and inspire the black protests. Mm -hmm. Their main focus was to regroup the community programs, community survival, and to police the police. Lowndes County Freedom Freedom Organization merges with the station stationwide stationwide is on your side. <laughs> Statewide National Democratic Party of Alabama. This brings in so many more additional resources. And I wonder if that's when because it's saying the National Democratic Party of Alabama is that at the point where, you know, some of that switch has officially happened, right? Like the Democrats are now more so representing um, black people as well as marginalized communities rather than the Republican Party, right? I am. I'm going to say yes, but I'm mm -hmm. also going to say I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I'm not sure either. I was just wondering. Yeah. Okay. If, if anything that we say is wrong and you want to let us know, please just come to us. In a nice way. We'd be more than happy to receive the feedback. Yep. So then we have election day in 1966. White people were outnumbered um, in who was waiting in line to cast their votes. Fraudulent actions did happen. Like people were like people who were declared to be dead. Isn't that so funny? Because that happened recently that white people that were declared dead had somehow casted a vote. And white landowners would run up on African-Americans in their vehicles and threaten, threaten them to vote for the white guy that they wanted to win. And ballots I'm... were also thrown into Big Swarm, Big Swamp Creek. No federal regulations were put into place to prevent things like this from happening at the time. So unfortunately, the African-American <sighs> candidates did lose their first year with That's being terrible. on the ballot. Also, I immediately thought of like one of those asshole trucks with like the... <laughs> The chopped off exhaust, dual exhaust, and the stupid, the ball sack hanging from the truck. Like I, I love them with, nut sacks. With that fucking flag on the Yum. back window, like, and everything. Even though this is, like, obviously not that time period. I'm just immediately thinking of that. It's just, uh Well, you know, like, you know, like fashion styles and trends, they, all, they always come back just in a different skin. Yeah. It's, it's the exact yeah. same thing. Yeah. So then um, King was assassinated in 1968, mm -hmm. and then in 1970, John Hewlett from earlier becomes the elected official sheriff for oh, the wow. town of Lowndes County. This was the first major shift in local government for the town and or for the county. And Charles Smith was the first county commissioner. Miss Eurley A. Haynes was the first female superintendent elected. Awesome. So it wasn't they didn't get any candidates in office their first year but in the second year they did even through all of these powerful accomplishments african americans are still treated as similarly as if it had been in the 60s racial wealth gap and discrimination still exists and because of what this little county was able to do major changes in our county was able to happen and or in our country in our mean, country yes, yes, yes thank you and i don't remember the exact topic that i was listening to on a podcast but i was listening to something that was a little bit more recent mm -hmm. and they actually talked about snick and uh snick oh. snick was not only specifically for african americans but they were for any and all minorities when it when it came to like the growth and development of snick later down the that's road. awesome yeah and, and i didn't know too much about sn double c or snick oh um, i forgot i'm so sorry if anybody remembers the sit-in protests okay that was snick 
Oh, okay. That started yeah, in Yeah, I mean, those are pretty famous. We do learn about those. You see the yep. pictures in history class in the books and stuff. Yep. Um, no, that's really interesting. I also thought it was intriguing from an intellectual standpoint. And, like, I, I definitely have an interest in history overall and American history. I, I like how this – it's technically a documentary or is yes. it a movie that's documentary? Okay. So I, I think it's interesting how it shows where different – pieces of more famous and well-known parts of history actually connect to some of the aspects that maybe people didn't know about as yeah. as much or we hadn't learned about um you talked about basically the rise in the black panther movement yep. um and the organization and i honestly didn't know that that's sort of where they got their roots so it was well, very interesting I yeah know. All right, Heather. So what do what did you bring to the table today? Sure. Yeah. So um, I tried to look up, you know, some different people that, you know, as we talked about, maybe less less learned about in our history classes that were also very important um, in regards to um, the black community, black history um, and potentially the civil rights movement. Um, so the first one that I have to talk about is Bayard Rustin. So he is the man who actually organized the March on Washington in 1963, where MLK Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech occurred. He is credited with organizing it in under two months. Are and you being, serious? Yeah. Two months? Yeah. And they and had like that big of a tens turnout? Tens of thousands of people. Oh, my God. Th this is before social media, like snail yeah. mail is still Imagine a thing, Imagine how guys. you would be able to do that and bring people across the nation um, who are also oppressed people, as you already just discussed. Um, and again, he was being a man who is great with logistics of organizing civil rights events. So not only did he do this march, but he's also been credited with a multitude of other event organizing. And it's something that you don't really think about, like as a kid when you're learning these things, but then as an adult, especially in our own jobs, when we think about all that goes into, let's say, a project or something else that we're working on, you're like, yeah, like there was like a whole team of people behind all this stuff that happened. This dude worked behind the scenes mm -hmm. and helped to make a lot of these like events um, and protests and things like that occur. So he was basically one of those uh, one of the people in MLK's circle. Okay. So he also helped found the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and is credited with mentoring MLK to adopt his strategy of nonviolent protesting inspired by Gandhi. Oh, yeah. He worked heavily behind the scenes, primarily due to his status as a gay man. Oh, so also a gay black man. We got a homo in the house. Maybe that's why he's so good at organizing. Oh, oh, right. Bitch, right? Bitch. Mm. Toe tap on that one. Yeah. Not the gay man doing all this organizing. Um, and he's likely a primary. This sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> he's likely a primary reason why he is not as well known and not educated on even in high school history, um, as we well well know. Um, you know there are steps currently be being steps taking. People taking steps today to fight against the inclusion mm -hmm. of uh, gay and overall LGBTQIA history um, being taught, even in high schools where, like, you know, let's say people wanted to limit that in younger children, but even for right. adolescents. And I know when I went to school, we had none of that um, other than, like, very tiny amount, like, literally, like, two-sentence mention of, oh, yeah, and the gay rights movement happened, right? Like – yeah. oh so yeah sorry you know i'm just I, saying like I totally disassociated for a second and i no. was thinking about like there was this one book at school i think it was like the scorpion king and everybody knew which page and what paragraph and what sentence it was that were they were talking about anal sex and i went to i went into the public i went to the school's library to go read this one <laughs> sentence <laughs> I was thinking you were talking about rights activism. Yeah, I yes. was I was thinking about I mean that's okay. Sex you in you a book. heard gay man and you were like this man's an icon. Let me think about my experience here. No, Hell it's yeah. it is totally okay. I'm just saying that, you know, it makes unfortunate sense why he is he is left in the shadows. Yeah. Um and yeah. So people even within MLK circle had once pressured him to drop Rustin from the team due to his homosexuality. Someone went as far as threatening to go to the media with false rumors of an affair between him and MLK. Right? Yeah. 
He was also arrested for his homosexuality in his past. Um, in fact, Rustin had to adopt his gay partner to provide some legal protections, which this is something I didn't know. Yes. Um, but this was not uncommon even up through like the Correct. 1980s, maybe even early 1990s. Correct. Um, he openly advocated for gay rights later in the 1980s prior to his death in 1987. And in addition to all of this and his continued civil rights work, in the late 1960s through the 1980s, he also advocated for the rights of Jewish people who were being oppressed in the Soviet Union post-World War II. Wow. He served on multiple committees, did work with um, like one of the prosecutors from the Nuremberg trials. Like, it, There's like a whole section on like his work for Jewish people uh -huh. in um, Eastern Europe uh, post-World War II. Uh, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Obama. Um, of course, this is after his death, though, in 2013. I believe it was his um, I hope it's spooky his so happy. partner who was still – who I don't know if he's still oh. alive today but was alive in 2013 accepted that accepted the award. Yeah, um, because he was a little bit younger than he was. Um, and so, yeah, he was still there. Wow. Well. Um, so Mr. Rustin has multiple worthy quotes, but I wanted to read one that hits as an important reminder in today's climate and then another to give us some inspiration. So one, most of the time, the reservoir of racism remains stagnant. But, and this has been true historically for most societies, when major economic, social, or political crises arise, the backwaters are stirred and latent racial hostility comes to the surface. Scapegoats must be found, simple targets substituted for complex problems. The frustration and insecurity generated by these problems find an outlet in notions of racial superiority and inferiority. I don't know why I'm getting so emotional right now. I'm not crying, but no, I can just like I just, feel a, I can feel the emotion like in my chest and it like wants to come out, but it can't. Yeah, I I included this because I actually got teary eyed reading that because I've actually had conversations with just other other white people and saying that I think that that actually is where a lot of the problem lies in the current racism that is still here today, particularly in the United States. Um and that that's what I, I do believe that that's where a lot of that comes from mm -hmm. um, and in how um, people turn into those types of people um, because you're not born that way, right? Oh, no. Um, Nobody is born a certain way. Yeah. Um, you can fucking change anything about yourself. Yeah. So that one, I just wanted to say that because I, I felt like it really made me think it, like even as you know as a white person too and like how like how does someone become so intensely racist and like what were the things that turned them into that type of person um and then he, the second quote that i wanted to share was we need in every community a group of angelic troublemakers oh my god that is tattoo worthy and i fucking love that because i think it really points to his philosophy and he is the one that is behind MLK's uh, belief, belief in nonviolent protesting mm -hmm. and um, nonviolent ways and democratic processes to get the things that you want done and the changes that need to happen. And so the word angelic representing like that peacefulness, yeah. um, but also, you know, troublemaker in the sense of wanting to make the change. And I just, I don't know, that gives me hope that like, even though I feel like sometimes when I just like, talk about something on Facebook to start a conversation or even on our podcast or, you know, okay, I'm voting or something for changes that I want to see. Sometimes it feels like nothing's working or nothing's happening, but like maybe it is. Yeah. You know, like you got to keep trying and you got to keep working on things and organizing stuff and getting involved in things. And it doesn't also have to include violence either. Right. Um, and then the second person that I wanted to talk about goes in a little bit of a different direction. Um, and this part is about Dr. Vivian Thomas. Kind of felt close to my own passions and the things that I have done in my career. So um, this is an important uh, member of the black community who was involved in medicine and healthcare. Okay. Um, so this is Dr. Vivian Thomas. He was a major contributor to the first surgical technique to repair tetralogy of fellow. Um, for it's those who... Explain to me yeah. like I'm five. <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally had to sit down and be like, okay, how do I explain this to our listeners who don't have 
um, medical or healthcare related degrees, right? right. Um, so this is a fourfold plus uh, congenital or heart defect that is often diagnosed in newborns where the deoxygenated or oxygen poor blood is shunted to the aorta, that's part of your heart, for distribution to the body and its organs. This can make babies appear blue due to cyanosis or lack of oxygen and hence its historic term blue baby syndrome. Blue baby. Sorry, yeah. I had to do that. No, that's that's okay. My baby blue <laughs> <I'm> like, baby. <laughs> I don't want to make you feel bad, but like I'm about to go into a sentence that says <laughs> I'm sorry. So uh, me, it, you know, I'm sorry. This part's sad. But the congenital heart defect was historically fatal yeah. uh, because there was no treatment for it. And naturally you are um, sending blood without oxygen in it to the organs. Um, but thanks to the work of Dr. Vivian Thomas and his colleagues um, and those who developed additional and improved techniques later on down the line, the diagnosis ha now has a greater than 85% survival rate with surgical repair. The surgery is still major. Um, you do have like babies have to go to like specialized heart centers and things to get it done. Um, but the mortality involved with the procedure is much better than it even used to be. And the, um, the ability for these babies to survive long-term into adulthood exists. And that's awesome. When did he and his team, um, develop this technique in the 1940s? Holy shit. Yeah. Hold on. Scrab the wall. Wiggle like your ass and make your ass fall off. <laughs> Gas that off. Gas that okay, off. Okay, TikTok boy. Damn. Oh. <laughs> what? Remind, remind me I have a new vocal stem. Okay. I went, I'm gonna, I'll, no, okay. it has to happen. Okay. 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 Dumb ways to die. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to say in this, while we were talking about present day ra racism, dumb ways to live <laughs> <laughs> oh wow i love that I, and maybe that's a way to okay side note and then we're gonna have to cut this maybe that is actually a really good way to like describe what tiktok is to people because a lot of times people like it's like verbal stimming because people will literally talk in the terms of like tiktok trending like the background yeah quote or music or whatever it is that's where i got like, most of my notes like from in my head vines. is like dumb ways to die and like the zoolander stuff i would mm -hmm. tell you about and like yeah. yeah which is still going on all right go and get your tits so, out so yes this <laughs> this happened actually in the 1940s um but briefly, just to speak on Dr. Thomas, he was the grandson of an enslaved person born in Louisiana in 1910. He unfortunately lost his college savings during the Great Depression and was unable to attend college nor medical school. He was coded as a janitor at Johns Hopkins, but he actually became and worked as a scientist and mentor to cardiac surgeons. Fuck yeah. Right? He did not get a medical degree, but he was a mentor to cardiac surgeons. Um, he began working as a lab assistant to Dr. Alfred Blaylock at Vanderbilt University, but immediately started assisting Blaylock in surgeries after um, Blaylock had noticed um, how good uh, Thomas was with his hands and his dexterity. He was he worked at the level of a postdoctoral researcher, although sort of unofficially, under Blaylock's guidance regarding hemorrhagic and traumatic shock. When Blaylock eventually moved on and became the surgeon-in-chief at John Hopkins in 1941, he made Thomas his surgical assistant during a time when the medical campus was also still segregated. Pop off, Thomas! Yes. Choo -choo. This dude is incredible. In fucking incredible. So over the next couple of years, Thomas and Blaylock researched surgical solutions to the blue baby syndrome at the request of Dr. Helen Tausig, um, who was dealing with the issue as a uh, cardiovascular member of the team at John Hopkins. Okay. Um, using prior failed research on vascular surgery techniques to treat hypertension, they developed a shunt to increase blood flow from the heart to the lungs, also today known as the Blaylock-Thomas Tausig shunt. Oh, say that six times yes. fast. Or BT shunt for short. The Blaylock Thomas tossing shunt. The Blaylock tossing tossing shunt. <laughs> wow. On the second try, fucked yeah, it up. Yeah, gotta love those medical terms, right? So this was first used in 1944 when Thomas coached 
literally coached Blaylock over his shoulder wow. during the first procedure um, on a human baby. Thomas also specially customized the needles for that procedure for the infant size. Jesus Christ. The shunt procedure became internationally famous in 1946. Oh, well, first before that, um, I wanted to mention that, like, they talked about how, like, people traveled from all over the world to watch them do the procedures. Yeah. However, there was still so much racism that, like, people had a hard time accepting that oh, of course. Thomas was involved in this. Like, people looked to Blaylock first. Right. And, uh, and like... Like, um, they were seeing right through Thomas. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, in 1946, Thomas went on to develop an atrial septectomy technique for what is now called transposition of the great artery. So just for perspective for other people without going into that too much, um, transposition of the great arteries is an extremely serious congenital heart defect, mm. similar to churchology of fellow in the sense of it, I mean, if you don't fix it, you're gonna die like the kid's gonna die yeah. um it it requires significant uh by like different kinds of bypass surgery things like that uh, again sort of similar um but different specific anatomy issues than mm-hmm. the tetralogy of fellow yeah um after he developed this technique blaylock is quoted as having looked at this and stating this looks like something the lord made hence obviously an angel did honey yes hence the title of a movie about this story called something the lord made from 2004 i know it's available on hbo max i believe it's also available on prime and hulu um and then there's another documentary about this whole thing um dr thomas as well as like his partnership with blaylock um called partners of the heart oh that's so beautiful yeah, I saw some scenes of um, something the Lord made, and I watched a scene where basically Blaylock was, like, paging, you know, Thomas, Vivian Thomas. They wouldn't, like, they they were only allowed to use the page system for doctors, and he yeah. wasn't coded as a doctor, so the lady was refusing to page him overhead. And so he took it from the lady's hands, paged him. He was in the cafeteria, brought him over, and, like, the parents who were like so scared about their baby after like you know thinking that the baby's gonna die because they have the the blue baby syndrome yeah looked at thomas and was like oh my word like because he's black and then like people um in the like audience watching them do the procedure Mm -hmm. were like livid that he had come to help with the surgery and were like we're gonna have to talk about this hey stop the procedure well like the kid is like literally an active surgery like it was it was crazy um but anyways um In light of all this, and in speaking of, you know, the scene, it's important to remember that Thomas was not formally a doctor, was at one time considered a janitor at Johns Hopkins, and then finally a supervisor of the surgical laboratories, but never actually a surgeon. He faced segregation on campus for at least part of his time there. In 1976, he was finally awarded an honorary doctorate by Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and named an instructor in surgery. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, he, so beautiful. he did a lot of work, and he is now recognized for the work that he had done um, for pediatrics as a whole, as well as uh, cardiothoracic surgery. But, yeah. Sorry, you said whole. Oh. <laughs> as a whole with a W. Whole with a W. <laughs> Thank you so very much for bringing that to our attention, Heather. I really appreciate that. That was a really beautiful story. Yeah, I thought the scenes from the movie that I had seen were pretty good, too. Yeah, um, this is definitely was, something I'm going to have to look into. Yeah. I need to actually watch the full thing. <laughs> yeah. So, what did, so, folks, what did you guys think? You know? Did you learn something? I know. I sure as fuck did. I, I did, too. I, I couldn't stop myself from researching. I kept looking up more people, and I'm like, we have a limited time for this episode. I can't keep doing this, but... Yeah. Yeah. Heather was like, I've got like three or four things to bring up. What's what do you think is more important? And I was like, I think these are going to be some good options here. Let's talk about these. Yeah. Especially when you brought up the doctor one. I was like, that's I mean, that's in your wheelhouse. Yeah. Not Heather's not a surgeon, but because of her career, I think that would be great. Yeah. So, yeah, I the, the biggest thing that hits me with that, especially is imagine. Okay, so like. We talk a lot on this podcast about how, like, end-stage capitalism and how, like, the day-to-day sometimes can suck. I've talked about how I do have a passion for my job, but sometimes, you know, like, you're getting burnt out, right? Yeah. But then imagine on top of it, 
you do not get recognized for any of the work you're doing. You are treated like less than human throughout that entire thing. And yet you're continuing on to research for the better for humanity in spite of all that. Yeah. Like how incredible is that? And I'm not saying that that's like, that's not to validate the trauma and yeah. the lifelong trauma that that man was put through in, in being oppressed. I can't imagine having the motivation to do that in today's society. What if you were told that like you had to fight against all of that too, right? Like all of that. And so I think his story especially and maybe because I was more able to put myself in the shoes of someone like working in the, in medicine and stuff, mm -hmm. I really felt that extra layer of what would it be like if I was oppressed to that degree, which I have never had to experience. Yeah. And so for me, at least, that story was was especially important because it gave me that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. And yeah. thank you, listeners. We do have one more thing to touch on before we end this in this week's episode. I do apologize. It is my responsibility to be up on up and current on moon phases and i have <laughs> slipped through the cracks on that oh we we've we i think personally we've we've felt the moon phases as they've gone yes <laughs> so on the day that this episode comes out the 20th of february we are moving into a new moon and um this is going to be a direct quote the last thing that the moon will do before moving into pisces and meeting up with the sun will be to join forces with saturn the planet of boundaries and hard work, completing its stint in Aquarius. Ooh, Aquarius. Your emotional commitments and relationships to self-discipline will be top mind leading into the ethereal new moon. Mm. Though this could set a bit of a heavy, serious tone, you'll do well to think of it as solitude, fertile foundation from which you can plant the seeds you want to see flourish. Remember, guys, um, new moons setting your intentions on things that you want to work on. Basically, Saturn is the planet of reality checks, <laughs> which can serve you while well while you wearing your rose color glasses during this Pisces new moon. For instance, if you're thinking of starting a, a new side hustle or making a romantic move, holding on past behaviors, patterns, and lessons in mindset can set you up for more success in the long haul. And also, Venus will be moving into Aries um, right after the new moon, fueling your passions. Ooh, so there's going to be a lot of heightened emotions um, around the things that you care about. Specifically, what I read was like money relationships uh, within yourself and the ones that you are involved with. Mm. Um, Just so, trying to give it positive vibes rather than the negative side of yes, the passion, right? <laughs> yes. So please do be careful. And of course, if you're listening to this after Monday, uh, whoops, sorry. So anyway, thank you so very much, everybody, <laughs> for listening to our episode and being a part of this important topic this week. We really appreciate it. And remember, mm -hmm. you know, we're not an education podcast, but we like to do some education. We want to encourage everybody to have these tough conversations and educate each other ar around you. And I know it's tough, um, but together we can do it because we believe in you and your big sister, Heather, and your big brother, Jaren. Well, I actually, I prefer that we're like mommy and daddy. So <laughs> your mommy and daddy, we're here to encourage you to do those things. So Heather, I love you so much. Jaren, I love you too. I got to go pee. <laughs> and listeners, we love you guys. And uh, don't forget, if you want to interact with us, you can do that by visiting our link tree in the description of this episode. And all of our resources can also be found at the very bottom. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for listening today, guys. Um, You'll hear from us next week. We love you so much. Yeah, I love you guys. And this is us signing out. Bye. Bye.